All right, everyone, welcome to the show. Uh, today, we're gonna to be hosting our DevOps office hours. It's February 3rd, 2021. My name is Eric Osterman, and I'll be leading the conversation. I'm the founder and CEO of Cloud Posse. We're a DevOps accelerator, and that means that we help companies own their infrastructure in record time by building it together with your team and then showing them the ropes. So if that sounds interesting, head over to cloudposse.com slash quiz to get started. For those of you new to the call, the format is very informal. My goal is to get your questions answered. So feel free to unmute yourself at any time if you want to jump in and participate. If you're tuning in from our podcast or YouTube channel, you can register for these live and interactive sessions by going to cloudposse.com slash office hours. We host these calls every week. We'll automatically post a video recording of this session to our YouTube channel, as well as follow up with an email so you can share that with your team. So with that said, let's kick it off. Uh, I have a few uh, announcements I'd like to make, actually quite a few announcements. We've had a very busy week. Uh, the first one is uh, we officially released our provider for um, our util provider. So we're using that now in our YAML config and the Terraform provider here I'm talking about, oops is uh, a very simple implementation that at, for right now just handles deep merging of YAML or JSON. Uh, and this is because we're building up our strategy more and more to use YAML as a way for uh, conveying configuration settings because YAML can be downloaded from remote sources while Terraform bars can't. YAML can be uh, interpolated while Terraform variables cannot very easily. YAML can um, you know, be merged uh, as well, and we can select which YAML configurations we want to load, but TFRs, we cannot choose which Terraform var files we want to load. It always loads all of them. So uh, YAML is a great alternative, and once you start using a lot more of it, you're going to want to have data structures, and those data structures, you're going to be want to be able to deep merge. So that's why we did deep merging um, in native uh, Go here. All right, any questions before I, before I continue on that one? All right, the, uh, the other tool that we've been working on for the past couple months, uh, we finally branded it and released it. It's called Turf. Uh, Turf is a tool I wish we didn't need to have. Uh, Turf fills in the, the gaps for some things that we've run into trying to achieve compliance on AWS. Turf is not designed to be an AWS specific tool, but a tool that we use uh, for various kinds of automation tasks, which cannot be addressed by Kubernetes or Terraform or Helm or any of these other things. It's our escape hatch uh, to work with Turf, uh, the, 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 the landscape upon which we build on. So uh, some things that, you know, if you're uh, achieve, trying to achieve compliance in AWS, one of the things you got to do is uh, do something with your default VPCs. The default VPCs, uh, uh, don't have the appropriate configurations. You could import those into Terraform and manage them, also manual, we don't do that. We could just delete them and make sure it's not a problem at all. So that's what we went ahead and did. We just delete all the default VPCs or default resources uh, in the account that uh, would affect compliance. Other tools like this exist for that, uh, AWS Nuke, uh, Cloud Nuke, but those, uh, those were built with a different intention in mind. Other things that we have had to do is like, when we want to deploy a security hub across an organization, there's no way to natively enable it in uh, every account that's already been provisioned. So here's a tool that lets us do that for every region. Um, disabling, so there's some, for security hub controls, for example, there's some security hub controls that are global. And if you just provision them with Terraform, uh, you're going to be paying for it for every region that you have it deployed in, and you're going to end up spending like 16 times or 20 times uh, uh, the amount of money for those config rules that are uh, duplicated. And then um, uh, enabling uh, guard duty across the organization is another thing. It's easy if you're starting from scratch and you enable this at the org level before you create any of your member accounts, then they can inherit the settings. But if you already have 15, 20 accounts deployed and you hadn't already deployed guard duty, uh, this will help you enable it 
across all the accounts as part of a cold start process. Uh, I think these, these commands speak more to you if you've already tried to deal with it and ran into the problem. If you don't have these problems right now, probably uh, something you can look past. Uh, Matt, are you on the call? Matt? Um, yep, I'm here. Anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, no, I think you did a good job of covering both the provider and um, and what Turf does. So I cool. think uh, I, more to come, right? We have some more things to add probably to Turf to handle some other scenarios we've come up with. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, we also distribute binary releases for this. Uh, so it's very easy to run uh, and yeah. You'll find uh, similar tools out there, but they're in Python and uh, you know Bash and not tested. Hi, Eric. May I ask you a question about that? For sure, Leah. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, sorry for the incomings. I'm. I'm. Uh, uh, do, do you hear the sounds, or is it clear? Do you, can you hear me? We can hear you, but there is a lot of background noise. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry for it. It's. it's I mean, <laughs> I, I have nothing to do with that. Uh, okay, uh, I'm using. Mm, Netflix's uh, console me to, to manage AWS organization accounts, for example, setting permissions, for example, 100 accounts uh, uh, at once. Do you, know, do you know about that or is this? Yeah, I, I saw that. Uh, I saw the tool. I, I, I was aware of it. It's kind of like Netflix's response to Amazon's landing zones or a control tower. Yeah, but, uh, and uh, is, is, is this tool turf uh, this, doing the same job? For example, setting permissions, roles uh, of multiple organizations? No, like, no yeah. I think they're solving pretty distinctly different problems. Um, the, the Netflix uh, product you're talking about, if anybody reminds me, it can remind me what it is, uh, we'll bring it up here. But it is like Control Tower. It is for like an account factory and, and making sure you have secure permissions across all those things. This tool is not for that. This tool is literally like for cold start problems, like when you're setting up uh, the AWS account and you had some wrong settings initially to correct those settings. Um, uh, deleting the default VPCs in an account, I guess, yeah, technically this one should be run every time a new AWS account is created. But in terms of like the factory piece, the account factory part, we're still using Terraform for that. We're still like the way we generate uh, uh, AWS accounts is in our components module under modules here account. This is how we manage our accounts in Terraform and uh, it consumes a list of accounts that we create with other, lots of other settings. Thank you very much. Um, but yeah, do share that uh, Netflix product. It might be interesting for others. And let's see. Got the, a question uh, on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, Julian here. How's everybody doing? Um, so with Turf, as you're developing that, um, is there anything in the roadmap for like auto setup of config? I joined in a little late, so I don't know if that was covered or if that was lower down and I haven't gone to the page yet, but setting up AWS config or maybe like deploying some default config rules across an organization um you know maybe upon like organization stand up or, and does turf provide any um i guess like does it reach out tendrils into the organization provided it has the proper access to maybe map out what might exist or is that any expected no so yeah the, the scope of turf uh yeah, and i really want to make sure this is very clear this is not the, the idea is if we don't have to add another thing to this thing will be successful. Uh, yeah, cool, cool, Turf cool. is designed to only do the things that we couldn't have done out of the box with Terraform. So let, let's talk about AWS config for a moment. We have a Terraform module for AWS config. Uh, mm -hmm. It's open, I, you, you see my screen here, I believe that I'm sharing. Uh, mm -hmm. We've like imported every single managed rule by Amazon already into that. And we manage AWS config successfully now with Terraform. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, I might have missed it at the beginning. Yeah. Oh well, no. Probably, we, talk, you, we did not talk about this today. We've talked about it at other office hours. But yeah, just just yeah. to be aware that we do have uh, AWS config module uh, at Cloud Posse. 
For 2021, security and compliance is one of the major themes for, secure, for Cloud Posse, and we're rolling out the full suite of AWS uh, security products uh, managed by Terraform. Uh, so we got Security Hub, Guard Duty, AWS Config, uh, support for uh, Access Analyzer, IAM Access Analyzer is coming out uh, soon. Uh, firewall Manager. Firewall Manager is coming yeah. out soon. AWS Inspector, we already have. So just we're trying to uh, open source all of that stuff so we have a fully turnkey compliant uh, capable platform. Actually, it's a perfect segue into another uh, thing I wanted to share. Uh, let's see if um, it yeah, is. That, that's awesome here because I'm actually working on like SOC 2 compliance. So that that's um, exciting. Yeah, you're, well, then you'll really dig uh, the other thing. So what we something a little bit controversial and something that uh, I'm sorry if it's, um, uh, let's see here, where did I have? Yeah, so here's an example. Uh, we are changing the defaults for a lot of our modules and uh, we are changing our defaults to be the most secure by default. Therefore, to be insecure, you got to be explicit about being insecure uh, rather than implicitly, uh, you know, assuming things are secure. So all of our modules uh, over the past couple months, we've been working on updating those defaults. We've partnered with Bridge Crew. Bridge Crew is providing uh, uh, security scanning on all of our Terraform modules uh, against the standards of Chekhov and some other internal ones. So now you can see which standards our modules are compliant with uh, based on the default settings. You can always make a module incompliant by make, using bad settings, but by default, they are good uh, for the most part. Um, so if you don't see this security and compliance section on a Cloud Posse module, it's just we haven't updated the README yet. By, by next week, all of our modules have, will have been updated. Awesome, appreciate it, Eric. And I'll just add one quick thing about Turf. So when you do enable things like um, like security hub and guard duty using turf it does uh, it does reach out into all of your all of your accounts in the organization and turn those things on across the organization and also in every region that's enabled um, in in your organization as well so that you do get a full blanket um, security hub and guard duty Im implementation. That was really the impetus of writing it to start out with that doing that was a lot of manual click ops um, that couldn't be done in Terraform or it would have had to be done in Terraform um, in like a very verbose, like crazy way to manage it. So um, this was, the, this was the, the better alternative. So that's why it exists. And one other thing, like I have seen some other modules in Terraform that do it but they call local exec in the end and shell out to do some stuff. And we try to avoid using local exec in our modules so that when things are local execing, it's more explicit. It's something that happens outside of the life cycle of the module. This is pretty cool because I'm going to be implementing some of these things for a client. Um, do you have the ability, you said it reaches out to the entire like organization. Do you have the ability to scope it or is that a, I'll have to look at the code, I'm sure, but you know, is, yeah, that a, is it, that a possibility, like an organization um, unit or something along those lines? Yeah, currently it, it doesn't, it doesn't um, restrict itself because like the, if you read the, the foundational security best practices, as well as like CIS, they say that it has to be enabled in every, in every account in the organization. So we did it to do that, but adding like an exclude account flag or something should be pretty simple um, to do to, to that thing. So I, I, I don't see any reason why we couldn't do that if someone really wanted, uh, wanted that. Piggy piggybacking on what Matt said, and, and, and this is like, it's one of these things, do you want to have practical security or do you want to pass the test? If you want to pass the test, you have to have it enabled in every single account. Are you actually going to be any, you know, uh, you know, any more compliant technically from a security perspective? Uh, maybe not. Uh, especially if those accounts aren't in scope for compliance, but the tests are still going to nag you if you don't do it. So we just enable it everywhere. That's why we don't exclude. Makes sense because that's one less question to answer to an auditor. So yeah, to to explain it. <laughs>
So, all right. So next announcement is, okay, this, this has been uh, a, it's <laughs> some stuff seems so incredibly trivial until you go about to try and implement it. Uh, let me talk about this. So uh, null label, it's foundational to every one of our Terraform modules. Many of you who use our Terraform modules are very familiar with it. You know, t it provides the standard interface to all of our modules. So all of our modules take a consistent set of parameters uh, and those can be passed between modules through something called context. The problem was that uh, we, we did one thing that was very opinionated, which were our tags were always title case, but tags in GKE, for example, or GCP have to be lowercase. So that precluded use of this module for that. Even though the null label module is not provider specific, uh, it was originally actually based around the null provider. Uh, and for historical reasons, we kept it that way. Right now, Terraform null label doesn't even use the null provider and it bases, it's based entirely on just native uh, functionalities within HCL, the language. So what we've added is support now for uh, lowercase uh, tags and, val and the ability to specify the case on labels and label values. So you can uh, be con consistent about that. And let's see here, 70 comments. This was a very difficult thing to arrive at the interface, especially because it in at the scope of this is it impacts all 150 or 160 of our Terraform modules or whatever is we have uh, out there. Um, and we had to get it right. Um, so big thanks to Vladimir for helping us with that and Jeremy for uh, providing uh, code review and input on it. The other big announcement with this is uh, we are using validation now for like the case thing. And as we can do more validation, we will. But that means that new versions of the null label module do not work on Terraform 0 0.12 anymore. And since we're rolling this out across all of our modules, we are officially dropping support for 0 0.12 in new versions of our modules. Hopefully, I mean, 15 is dropping any day now. So, uh, you know, supporting three, three versions back is pretty good so far. Any questions on that? All right. So the other thing we have done is uh, we released a fleetingly simple module. Uh, it's called Terraform AWS Security Group. Uh, it's not rocket science, but it's very different from like the AW, uh, Terraform AWS modules community security group module, which is very opinionated and creates like a sub module for every kind of service. No, uh, this security group module is strictly for managing lists of ACLs. And it does that by provisioning the security group rules and optionally provisioning the security group itself. Why this module is really nice is now throughout our entire module ecosystem, anywhere we need to manage ACLs, we can do that in a very flexible way to control both ingress and egress simply by adding a single parameter, which is like, or two parameters, which is, you know, the, uh, if the security group is, should be created or not, and uh, the, the rules themselves. So we're going to be rolling this out like to our uh, EKS modules, our EC2 auto scale, Bastion server, EC2 instance module, everywhere. So our modules uh, can, so you can control the fine grained access controls for them in a better way. Also something you want to have for compliance. Any questions on that one? All right. The other announcement is HashiCorp did announce new versions uh, for the Kubernetes and Helm providers. Uh, those announcements are always welcome, but come with a little bit of pain. Uh, major releases uh, break version compatibility. And when we do any pinning or updates in our modules, uh, it forces everyone then to use those new versions of the providers. So uh, you'll see us rolling out support for this uh, you know, over the coming weeks. Um, 
Any, I haven't looked into the specific details of the announcement. Okay, Helm 2 support is removed. That sounds fine by us. We're not using that for a year now. And uh, changes to the provider authentication, which have made it um, a little easier to use. But I think there's some bugs with this right now. Um, I, I've just seen some chatter with folks having trouble upgrading. Any other announcements? Uh, Eric, uh, there, there's a fundamental uh, edition in provider 2.0. Uh, it's custom resource item, uh, and it will it will enable us to um, use direct YAML yeah. description files. And it's, it's very very important item, and uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I have. Uh, I saw your point. Uh, I actually have that one here. I do want to talk about it. So, I mean, support for custom resources in the Kubernetes provider has been around for a little while now. Um, so, uh, to me, that wasn't uh, a, a total announcement, but that is cool. I, I do want to talk more about that in a second. So, let, let's pause on that and come back to it. Um, the other announcement was uh, Slack came out with their postmortem of what happened on January 4th when we all got back to work. Uh, long and short of it, wasn't our fault. It was AWS, uh, and they, what happened is they scaled out very rapidly, and the latency um, uh, over the transit gateway grew, uh, and uh, they were they weren't able to access their monitoring systems, and the whole system, the whole kingdom came crashing down. Um, Amazon identified some problems on their end related to the transit gateway that I think they're going to fix, and that's the gist of what I got. I didn't read it too closely. Anybody uh, have anything else they wanted to add? The that? biggest thing that stuck out with me on that is that they scale up and down every half hour. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That was pretty impressive. Yeah. I, or in this case, they were also scaling out by something like 1,200 nodes or something. Um, all right, that was the, that. Oh, uh, and Terraform support for the uh, Prometheus. Uh, the new Prometheus service uh, in the AWS provider that's been merged now. I haven't tried it, but uh, that's good news. And uh, yeah, check out our past recordings. If you haven't already, just go to uh, youtube.com slash C slash cloud posse. Uh, um, I, I can't see the, the last last point edition, the unauthorized issue. The, did you see that? The, Kubernetes provider unauthorized issue here in the agenda. Oh, on on uh, the on the on wait this this announcement. No, no, no. Um, in the in the office R Slack channel, I added the question oh. about Kubernetes provider unauthorized issue, which, which is which is very very. Uh, it's created a lot of trouble to me, and the community discusses in some uh github channel yeah i see it here i i don't have anything to add to it any uh vlad you're on the call maybe vlad, uh, vlad. Uh, we have Vlad here with, with the very yeah. same <laughs> yeah it's the same vlad. I, I i didn't know that i didn't know yeah, that. yeah, yeah. it's a small <laughs> world here i saw that yeah 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 yeah, yeah. So, this, yeah this is the same vlad it, it will be very nice to meet him here because yeah, he claims that he sold it very yeah. nicely. Yeah, he's a, he's a solid uh, engineer. All right, glad. Yeah, so I tagged him in it. Let's see if uh, he uh, responds uh, to that. Okay. We'll come back cool. to that. Talking points. All right. So uh, I wanted to address a, a long question by Evan. Evan, are you on the call today? You might not be. Uh, I'm uh, muted. Yes. Oh, cool. Uh, hold on. Let me pull up your uh, your post in the channel if I can find it fast enough. Um, Anyways, I have it written down in my own notes here. Let me just uh, read it out. Well, I can uh, give a brief overview. The question was mostly about, um, you know, I, I'm pretty new to this, and I see that uh, often with Terraform or any kind of infrastructure as code, we see a breakout of 
um, you know, the different environments, uh, primarily so you can have different configurations for each. Um, but I've noticed that there doesn't seem to be a really good way to <clears throat> assure that you're running the same stuff in production that was run in staging. Uh, I'm more used to a scenario where you would deploy the code to a staging environment uh, with a with a branch, perhaps, yeah. and then once that was okay, you would push that into your master branch or main branch or whatever production yeah. branch, and then that would be deployed yeah. to your production afterwards. Yeah, no, that's a good summary. Let me put, uh, let me um, bring up uh, or add some additional context to it. And for those of you uh, who are looking at my screen, I, I brought up his message here that he posted a couple days ago. And I think it is really a good question because it, it's probably something a lot of newcomers to Terraform um, encounter. I think it's also really interesting because Coming at it from like a purely software development approach, it, it, it can feel a little bit peculiar. And I'll explain why that is. So the, the thing, what, what, he's, uh, what Evan's getting at is why in Terraform do we have this uh, repository set up where, we, uh, where we're using a lot of the configuration for a given environment and it's broken down into different directories like you'll have a prod directory and then you'll have terraform code in there and then you'll have a staging directory and you'll have terraform code in there and it's your responsibility to promote an upgrade from one of those directories to the other directory Com let's contrast that with like a traditional software development process where you know you you, you open up a branch uh you, you might have a preview environment uh, uh, come up from that. You're building a Docker image. It has all your code in there. It's a service that's running. If there's any problems with that service starting up, the old service can still stay online. Uh, if you want to roll back, you can just deploy that other previous container. And that's really nice. I think the problem comes that Terraform is, a, is solving a different problem at a different part of the stack. And while it is infrastructure as code, it is a it's it's a little different. So first of all, um, what we see uh, so the reason we don't recommend uh, using branches with Terraform the way we would with software is with Terraform what we're really doing is performing migrations, and there's no easy way to roll back and forth between those migrations. And the order in which we perform migrations matters. Uh, if you perform, we, we talked about this uh, last week, actually, if you're relying on like data sources in Terraform, it's very easy for you to create a cycle in your code uh, w that where you first provision the resource, then you update the code to use a data source that looks for an ID that was created from the previous run and you apply it and that works. And then you go and take that same pattern, you deploy it to staging and it fails. Why does it fail? Well, because you, 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 you incrementally did migrations in your dev environment, but you didn't perform those sa the same order of operations in staging. So that's one of the reasons why you want to do that. But I, the other thing I want to point out here is that Terraform is really doing the continuous delivery for you. And then you have patterns for how to do continuous delivery. If we look at how Argo CD works, Argo CD is doing continuous delivery to Kubernetes. And while there's a thousand tools out there to help you deploy to Kubernetes, ultimately what you're doing is you, you generate some resources, you generate these manifests in, that are in YAML or in JSON, and you submit those to the Kubernetes API. So what Argo CD is doing is like, hey, you, you point me at a GitHub repo, and I'm just gonna make sure that my, the, you know, this Kubernetes cluster looks identical to this GitHub repo, synchronizing everything. So what happens is your job as an operations engineer or release engineer or whatnot is to massage this, this repo into the desired state you want. So with Terraform, what we're, we're, when we're working with Terraform, what we're really trying to do is kind of in the GitHub repository, describe the desired state of our infrastructure for all environments. And keep in mind, staging and dev, those are production. 
but just for a different user. Staging is production for like your QA team and for the business. Dev is production for your developers. And we still need those to be as stable as possible. Um, let's see. Uh, those are my points. Uh, the other point is that, yeah, I think a lot of this also stems from um, a, a similar best practice for working with Terraform, which is more trunk-based development. So merging to master or main uh, more frequently. Do you have any and, thoughts around kind of separating compositional parts of uh, either Terraform or Teragrunt from the configuration such that, um, you know, you would always expect to run the same modules um, in each um, environment, but perhaps with different variables? Yeah, yes, yes, with a asterisk. I mean, that's what we ultimately want. But the thing is, at any given time, all environments are probably not going to be on the same version. And with Terragrunt, I believe one of the common patterns is, you know, you'll have your uh, Terragrunt.hcl file in one of your project folders, and that's going to call out to some module pinned to some version. And you'll have like a production folder maybe, and a, and a staging folder and a dev folder. And it's all going to have that uh, Terragrunt HCL file. And in your, in your dev folder, it'll be pointed to maybe a branch or some other release and staging, it'll be another one. So at any given time, while we want all of our environments to be identical, they're actually never identical except for a brief moment of time because changes are always moving through this pipeline like a wave going through. Um, um, may I, may I intervene? Uh, Eric, uh, I was using the folder structure in, in Telegram before, but it, it created a lot of problems because um, I, I was finding myself to carry out all those Telegram files from one folder to another. Agree. Uh, and, and then, and then I, I, I figured out some uh, magical solution, which, which was uh, not using folders, but using branches. For example, all, all the pro all different environments now in my configuration lives in different branches, like production is in different branches, staging is different branch, all of this. So, so I don't have to carry out all those configurations from one to another, but just merging them. So uh, this, this, this approach is called uh, multi-branch GitOps actually. And I'm, I'm very, very, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, it, it works very well. I mean, uh, it's, it solved a lot of problem for me. Yeah. Uh, I had, a, I had a question I want to inject like in this conversation with me. Um, I, want, I was wondering kind of the patterns. There's one like you have the code base, like your main TF for like say stage, dev, prod, whatever. But then you have your modules where you inject values into those modules for a stage prod. And so what I'm wondering is how do you like organize it all? Um, before the puppet days, we had something similar and they had versions that like say this module was test it in dev, test it in stage, test it in prod, and they do code promotions. And what happened is they would do these complex Git gymnastics to merge into the proper branches for those things. But then that just overwhelmed developers, they wouldn't use the tools. Um, so just trying to kind of figure out like, how do you keep the environments and then use code promotional modules together? I just want to interject, I feel like uh, uh, there's a few, there, the problem needs to be solved. There are a few ways to solve it. The way you solve it will inevitably be um, what your team feels the most comfortable with. And if, uh, as Leah points out, you know, if working with many long lived branches is a sophistication your team is capable of doing, then it's probably an effective solution. There's a lot of articles out there, uh, you know, poo-pooing on that, uh, on long-lived branches and things like that. But there's no right or wrong answer, just like there are a lot of right or wrong answers for, you know, tabs versus spaces or whatnot. I like the idea of trunk-based because, uh, it, you know, there's, a there's only one really long-lived branch and managing that it's very easy to manage the changes to that branch. Now we could say, but yeah, like you said, like in the, traditional like Terra Grunt approach with multiple directories, whatnot, it is difficult. And there's a lot of copy pasta between that, uh, which can run out of, fall out of date. 
there are strategies then to deal with that. So with every one solution, there it, com it comes with a trade-off. And Cloud Posse has yet a totally different uh, approach to all of these um, approaches as well, which I hope very soon with Matt Gowie's help, we will have the documentation to show uh, as we're working on it. Um, anything else to add? Oh, hold on, Matt Calhoun, do you have, uh, as an expert on both ecosystems, uh, what would you add uh, as it relates to managing multiple environments with uh, Terragram? And he might have dropped off. I think we, we oh no, yeah, we, we, we lost Matt already, so. Um, anybody else have something wants to add to that? You got a hand raised, Eric. Oh, yeah, Julian. Was it related to this or another? Uh, no, it's a, it's a little different. I mean, I was wondering, um, kind of in the back of my mind, you know, I'm bringing Terraform to a an environment now. Um, we're starting pretty much from scratch over again after, you know, years of previous development and blah, blah, blah. So I was also considering, you know, should I use Terragrunt and should I just use core Terraform? Like, what would probably be the best way to start, especially, you know, I'm coming from some Terraform, but also some cloud formation before. So I'm trying to just really start with the best book forward. Um, as in regards to this conversation, that was really my only question. Yeah. I had a separate question about more so importing existing resources and, and configurations into Terraform in the most efficient way. Um, I'm sure that there's some open source tools, but I'm kind of a noob right now. So. Yeah. I uh, figured I'd ask that, but yeah, those yeah. are my two questions. Julian, I, I think it depends on which provider you choose, because for example, you choose M0, Terragrant is the only option, but if you choose Scalar or Terraform Cloud, then you, you, you should absolutely go with uh, Eric's uh, solution. Yeah, that, that is a consideration. Um, so choosing between Terraform uh, open source uh, or Terraform mm -hmm. native, so to say, versus Terragrant, will determine some of your options or choices for continuous delivery. So while, while currently, Oh, sorry. I was just going to say currently using Terraform cloud to host the state and deploying from the CLI just to deploy from the CLI. So yeah, if you're deploying from the CLI, then you can use Terra Grunt or uh, Terraform open source, and it'll be similar. One of the things, though, these providers do, like M0 or Spacelift or Spacelift or Terraform Cloud, is they help you make sure that no change is left behind. They help you ensure a workflow for promoting or deploying those changes, like the continuous delivery of Terraform. They help you with policy enforcement and stuff like that. What the problem I see with using a lot of this, the, the, the stuff that Terragrant open source does are things that you can achieve now with policies. And if you're using Terragrant to execute those, you're actually circumventing the ability for the policies to do their job. Now, that might not be a compelling reason for you to choose one tool or another, in which case, just disregard. Uh, Terragrant was a absolutely essential tool for many users until, until more recent versions of Terraform because it solved a lot of the pain points in Terraform. Now a lot of those same pain points don't exist from our experience working with Terraform at a pretty significant scale uh, of development. Okay, yeah, that definitely helps because um, you know I will be kind of bringing in a development team that is not you know, the existing one, but they're going to have to manage some resources because right now I'm the only one doing it. So, um, and so I think being able to set those policies, you know, using Terraform Cloud, I'm only using the CLI to deploy right now just because it's what I've been most comfortable with, having fully explored Terraform Cloud. But if it presents those advantages, I'll certainly dig deeper. Well, if you're using Terraform Cloud with Terraform Cloud open source, uh then Sentinel will still be able to enforce certain kinds of policies for the stuff that's changing. But if we're talking about another provider like Spacelift, they've built a, a very powerful policy layer using open policy agent that sits on top of this. 
So you can set really arbitrary, it, it, you know, it, so it uses Rego and Rego is a fully fledged language for defining policies. So, uh, you, so you want basically your tool, you want to use basically vanilla open, uh, open source Terraform for, for that to be able to work is the best way I can explain it. What, we, what we're doing at Cloud Posse, and we went into this a little bit before, and it, it, I owe a uh, more thorough explanation, but we're, we're using this concept of a stack configuration that's in YAML, and then we, we write adapters for it. So we have an adapter to read this stack configuration for Terraform Cloud. We have an adapter. When I call it an adapter, it's really just a Terraform module. So we have a Terraform module that reads this configuration and provisions your Terraform Cloud. We have a Terraform module that reads this configuration and provisions your Spacelift Cloud. Uh, we, you could write something that generates an Atlantis configuration from this. You could, you could use our, our, our command line tool called Atmos which reads this same stack configuration as another adapter, so to say. So this is how we do, this is how we use the stack configuration on, on the command line. And in our case, we, uh, we, all of our configuration is 100% in YAML and Terraform is really for all the business logic uh, for how to provision something and has no configuration. So it, it, the, the difference between that and like the Terragrunt approach and the Terragrunt approach, your configuration and your business logic is in the same place. And that's what we're trying to get away from. Gotcha. Appreciate that. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, can I add something? Hey, yeah. Hey, guys. So uh, uh, I want to support what you said, Eric, about Vanilla Terraform now being... Uh, much better than before, uh, including the new change direction, uh, sorry, change directory flag, if anyone tests that. So there is a flag that you can use so you can run Terraform from top level into subfolders. So that that, that was not it exists. Oh, before. nice. So nice. What yeah, they made it a real pain in the butt before to do that. Yeah, what um, I'm doing now is um, I'm at the uh, top root level of the repo and just crawling all the stacks like subfolders from one place using the nice. make file, of course. Yeah. So that's, right. I think this is one of the big reasons that you don't need to switch to into Teradrunt. I like Teradrunt, by the way, but now Terraform is, is more sophisticated, actually. So for newcomers, just keep it stupid simple. Use vanilla Terraform as much as possible. So yeah. that's one of the best advice you can have, yeah. I, on that note, in general, sure, I think it's like, wait until you encounter the problems before you pick the tool that solves the problems because you might not have the problems the tool was meant to solve. Um, My team calls it YAGNI. Has anyone Yagni. else heard of that phrase? <laughs> YAGNI stands for you ain't gonna need it. <laughs> that's a good one. Can you share that one in office hours? Uh, let, uh, we're gonna yeah, sure. introduce that uh, in our uh, vernacular yeah, let's here. Let's create a channel for it, that. Yeah, it's, it's it comes up. It's like you know, if somebody extracts out a string into a variable, but it's only used in one place. You know, it. It's, it's in the code review. It's real easy to just say Yagni. <laughs> Good one. I like that. I think there's a um, a really uh, parody uh, book on that one. Is it like the Kiss Principle or something like that? <laughs> All right, so uh, we covered, I think we will, we'll, this is a great topic. It's gonna keep coming up more and more, especially as it's top of mind for Cloud Posse and what we're working on open sourcing right now. It's been a one year monumental effort for us, but uh, it, it's starting to see the light of day as you're seeing more and more of these announcements come out from us, more of these tools come out from us, and uh, shortly more of the documentation uh, come out as well, because all of this stuff is garbage if we don't have the documentation. So uh, let's see. Um, I wanted to talk about. Oh yeah. So uh, Michael uh, uh, Dijon, uh, are you on the call? You're. Yeah, it's Dijon. Oh, Dijon. Sorry about that. Um, you had a question. Now this is almost a month ago, but I don't think we ever got to it directly. It was like, where does Geodesic and Atmos fit into uh, the Git workflows? And it's a good question. So for, for us, like we're deploying, um, so we have, 
we have a tool called GeoDesic. GeoDesic, uh, I, I've, uh, I, I've always called it like a cloud automation shell, but I think a more relatable way of talking about it is it's really a, a Linux distribution for DevOps that's packaged as a container. Um, and you can use this as your base image, or you can use our cloud pod and you can use our cloud posse packages repo, which has packages for all the DevOps tools that we depend on, which is like a hundred tools now. Um, so Judaistic is what we use as a way for combining all the tools into a container, combining Terraform code. We, you know, we, we wrote this tool called Atmos. Atmos is a tool that calls other tools. We add Atmos to Judaistic. We have a tool called Turf. I introduced you to today. We add Turf to Judaistic because we need a place. You ultimately need a runtime for doing these things. Geodesic is the base image for whatever image we ultimately use as our runtime for running the tools. So that's the relationship with that. Let me bring up another example, uh, Spacelift we need, or, or Terraform Cloud. You need, if, you, if you're using Terraform Cloud for business or enterprise and you want to have your workers running somewhere, like in ECS or on Kubernetes, you need a Docker image for it. What Docker image are you going to use? You could use their official one. But maybe you use local exec for some other commands, which I, we, I say we try to do. Or maybe you depend on a lot of other custom providers or things that you can't just pull from other sources. Or you, you also want to have tools that you want to be able to run Terraform locally for local development. You're not going to use that Terraform Cloud agent Docker image. So now you have another image you're using for Terraform Cloud and another image you're using for development, and that's a mishmash. So we just kind of conceded, let's look, try and use the same Docker image that we use for our CI, for our CD, for local development to reduce the number of variations. I'm, I'm not going to say it eliminates the problems, but it eliminates a whole category of problems that we otherwise would have faced. It's so nice. I, yeah, and I, I know, Andy, you've, you, you have your uh, dad's garage. Anvil. Yeah. Well, we call it Anvil now. Anvil now, but yeah. uh, and it's a worker container that's got all the tools in it, and you can run the same thing locally as you do. And it's just, it's, I love it. It's amazing. Or, or you want to debug something in your Kubernetes cluster? You can just launch DudeSick in that same cluster as a pod and ex exec into it, and you have your tool chain there, and it just works. Nice. Um, so it, it's pretty cool the possibilities. I've also deployed it to ECS, and um, yeah. So, so why why is Atmos and Geodesic, why are they in separate repos? Um, you need Geodesic to run uh, Atmos. No, nope, not right. at all. So, uh, yeah, uh, it's a, it's a, this is a philosophical question. Uh, one thing I hear every now and then is kind of like, why do we need so many tools? Can't we just have one tool? Um, I, I kind of agree with it. I, I want that. But if you've, if you've grown up like I have on Linux and you know, you know, 50 percent of the commands in user bin and bin, you, you understand why there are so many and why there isn't just one command for, for everything. And, and you've learned how pipelining and creating very small tools that do one thing very well works very well. And yeah, Linux was a that was a hard thing to learn in the you know, early you know, when you were just getting started. But now for most of us on this call, it's probably second nature, most of the stuff in there. And just like the DevOps ecosystem is kind of continuing in that trend, lots of small purpose built tools. So Atmos absolutely does not need Geodesic. Atmos, we use Atmos, so we've defined Atmos. It has these little um, workflow, these modules, that, as we call them, um, that encapsulate workflows for working with Terraform, encapsulate workflows for working with Istio, encapsulate workflows for working with Helm. They're opinionated. They're how we do it. And this compiles down to a binary. So Atmos is just a binary. Ultimately, you can download it. Here is the binary. Uh, I guess uh, I, I need to bug Andre. It should be cross compiled for every architecture. It's not. Uh, I don't know why that. So right now we just have the Linux binary here, but it should be cross compiled for every architecture. So we can run Atmos natively on a Mac or on Windows uh, WSL or, uh, or inside of GeoDesic, anywhere we can run Go apps. The thing is Atmos, what, what does it do? It depends on a lot of other tools. We didn't want to reinvent Terraform. We didn't want to reinvent Helm. We didn't want to reinvent Istio. So then Atmos calls those. But in the end, we still need to call Istio, Terraform, all those commands. And something needs 
to capture the, the, the know-how for how to call these commands. For the last few years, we've been using Wikiops and Wikiops has been very difficult to scale. So that's why we are now taking this opinionated approach to uh, how to call Helm, how to use Helm, and then how to define our configuration. So the key thing about Atmos here is, you remember I was telling you about the stack configuration and how we can use the stack configuration with Terraform Cloud. We can use the stack configuration for Spacelift. We can use the stack configuration with Atmos, and now we can use the stack configuration then to, uh, when we want to work with Helm or Helm file or with Terraform. It's just a consistent way for us to define configuration across tools uh, in a convention that we call stack. Awesome. All right. Uh, so that's the relationship between Atmos and, oh, and then Turf. Why is Turf not part of Atmos? Well, Atmos, that's out of the scope. Atmos is just how to run commands. Atmos isn't the command that implements the, the complicated functionality. So complicated functionality, we still implement, we created a client called Turf. So Atmos calls Turf. And where do we run Atmos? We run Atmos inside of GDC. And it, yeah, it's a layer cake, but- Does well. Atmos support the Mumoshu's project that grabs CLI tools automatically? I forget what oh, it's called. Uh, Dep or something, or mod. It's, it's, something, with, or it's mod. something about water, yeah. Yeah, I forget exactly. So, so first of all, Atmos is built on Variant, uh, at least for right now. Uh, Variant is a tool by Mumoshu. Variant is like, it, Variant is go task on like steroids times 10. Uh, pretty complicated to get up and running, but if, it's one of these things. If you have the problem and you find the tools that solves your problem, it's not Yak or well, yeah, Yakni was the, yeah, exactly. It's not Yakni anymore, uh, and it solved our problem. But uh, <laughs> sorry, I don't think I set that one up well. Uh, all right, let me move on to the next thing I had here. Uh, Atmos, we should discuss this. Yeah, Leah, I really want to talk about this. I think it's an important conversation to have. Um, and what does this refer to? So let me uh, open up that conversation briefly in Slack. Office hours pinned. Yeah, so Leah says, we should discuss this sometime since it's a revolution. Basically the ability to use Terraform now to manage any resources under Kubernetes. And I'm conflicted, but I have total, I feel like I have much more clarity on this uh, right now or getting to clarity. Uh, for where the lines lines are drawn. Yes, so you, am I, so am I. <laughs> it's very yeah. conflicting. Shoal, that's the name of it. So, so uh, for the longest time, the problem was that Terraform had support for Kubernetes, but you could only deploy proper, like, uh, I forget what you call them, like the core Kubernetes primitives, like deployment and ingress and service. But if you deploy your own custom resource, uh, you couldn't manage that with Terraform. That is no longer the case, so you can manage it. So Terraform now, just as you manage your infrastructure, Terraform can manage your, your stuff that runs on, side, on top of Kubernetes. So wait, wow, that sounds amazing. We use Kubernetes. We should deploy all of our apps now using Terraform to Kubernetes, right? Uh, let's pause on that. Let's see what the trends are, first of all, in Kubernetes and where the lines are drawn. So one of the big trends uh, for deploying to Kubernetes is GitOps. And for GitOps to work the way GitOps was intended for a lot of these things, if we're talking Flux or Weave work, or it's Flux or Argo CD, is that you're deploying the raw manifests. And if you have Terraform here generating the manifests and talking to the Kubernetes API endpoints directly, now Terraform is in conflict with that, or in, or in other words, Terraform now is at the layer of Argo CD. And do you want to use Terraform as your alternative to Argo CD for those things? It's been shown that Terraform is a pretty bad tool for continuous delivery, actually. That's why you have services like Spacelift, Terraform Cloud, M0, et cetera. It's non-trivial to do continuous delivery. 
And some of the things you want to be able to do with continuous delivery are like uh, blue green canary progressive rollouts, all that other stuff. That's not going to be solved if you're using the Kubernetes provider with Terraform. But so, Eric, I, asked you, I asked this question before in that very awesome presentation and the, the community uh, co uh, has a, a consensus on why use an, a, another layer of comp complexity such as Argo CD while we can do it with Terraform. I, I remember that you were there. <laughs> yeah, I, and I might have, I, I even might have said some things that I don't believe anymore. <laughs> um, and, and I don't necessarily believe every layer of this layer cake is required for every team. But it's, as soon as the team decides they want to try and do this one, just, we just want to do this one more thing. We just want to do blue green. And then suddenly like, well, yeah, you can reinvent the wheel and do that some other way in some snowflake fashion, or you can do it using a tool that was designed to do that one thing. So what, well, let me just, let me, I, I, in about uh, uh, one minute, I can explain the last part of this, which was just, I still think there's a brilliant place for this provider, for Kubernetes. And, and that's scoped to deploying your platform backing services in Kubernetes. What, like if you're gonna use Argo CD, what deploys Argo CD? Terraform, Terraform with a Kubernetes provider. If you're gonna deploy like um, the, the Terraform cloud agents somewhere, what are you gonna use? You can use the Terraform provider for that, that's perfect. You, things that don't need the sophistication or the advanced capabilities of something like an Argo CD is a great opportunity for it. But, what, but if you're gonna wanna deploy really complex coordinated rollouts across lots of services and deployments, and you also wanna figure out how you're gonna roll that back in a heartbeat, Argo CD is a brilliant solution for that. And what's also really nice about this is if you use something like an Argo CD, Argo CD is the thing that has to have access to Kubernetes and can run inside of Kubernetes. And it doesn't technically even need to ever be exposed. So your job in CI is strictly to manipulate the desired state in a Git repo somewhere. And it's a separation of concerns. And then Argo CD's sole responsibility is to make sure that the cluster looks like that Git repo. And I kind of like that architecturally. It's pretty, pretty clean. Um, so to, to clarify, you are now advising some another thing using Argo CD, Flux, or GitHub for Kubernetes deployments and using Terraform for outside Kubernetes, right? Did, did I understand correctly? Yeah, different layers of the stack too. Um, you know, Cloud Posse, we have this, the, the four layers of infrastructure I always talk about. You got your foundational infrastructure and platform. You got your shared services. Uh, you have your, um, and then the last, uh, so the first layer is your infrastructure. Second layer is your platform. Third layer is, are your shared services. And the last layer is your application. How you do continuous delivery depends on the layer you're operating at and what the life cycle looks like. So I think that for layers one through three or possibly one through two, Argo CD and Terraform Cloud are awesome. But for layer four, where you need really complicated rollouts for your custom in-house applications, that's where you can continue to use the tools from the previous two layers, but you might, if you wanna do complex progressive uh, delivery, you're gonna to wanna to use a tool that's designed for that, which is something like um, Argo CD. Such as, such as for example, blue Argo. green deployment or blue canary, do you mean? Oh. Yeah, exactly. If, you're, if you, if you wanna do, for example, like if you want to do canary or blue green, you, you would want to look at solutions like harness, but you're not going to do blue. You're not going to use harness to do your foundational infrastructure. You can't tear everything back down below your accounts. It doesn't make sense. So harness operates at layer four uh, of what we talk about the application, your applications and how you uh, do those. I think that the tools you choose, don't have to be mutually exclusive. And I think you can use multiple tools as part of the solution because they are operating at different layers. Jump in here and mention that this is an alpha release. Like it's the first alpha of the Kubernetes alpha provider. Terraform also has a, another Kubernetes provider and they released V2 a month ago, a couple of weeks ago. And it is, 
not the most stable thing in the universe, to put it in a very polite way. Mm. So keep that in mind, like, this is an alpha release. It's the first alpha. Like, it's not ready. So Vlad, I haven't oh, used it, but it's uh, an alpha. So this is a net new provider for Kubernetes. Yeah. With gotcha. the first one, I missed when... that. That's a pretty significant nuance to miss. Uh, and that's why, okay. The, what... I totally what don't is, understand what why they fundamental wrote fundamental difference between this and the old one then. I don't understand why they wrote a big blog post announcing this, but we're going to skip over that. As far as I know, and very high chance I'm wrong, uh, they uh, painted themselves into a corner with the first release because they, they weren't doing any code generation and stuff, and they only uh, were able to manage resources that they implemented themselves. Hence why it took forever to do deployments and ingresses and stuff that was not in the stable API. As Kubernetes users remember, like ingress only went GA a couple months ago or last year or something like that, but yeah. everybody was using it. So they, there were some decisions that were blocking in the Terraform Kubernetes provider, and they decided that they were going to start with a totally new one that's going to support CRDs, because CRDs, custom resource definitions became a big deal and they could not easily support that. So they decided to go with a ground up rebuild, which I guess is this. It's been open source for like more than a year, but I guess they released the first alpha and they want some users in here. So okay. that's why they did the blog post or something, but it's an alpha. That's cool. Well, thank you for uh, that uh, context, Vlad. May, may I? Oh, and Vlad, meet Leah, who you guys uh, have been. Uh... Hey, Vlad. <laughs> Nice to meet you, by the hey. way. I, mean, I would like to discuss with this unauthorized problem with you. Uh, so it, it's created a lot yeah. of problems. But, but not now, not now. Just I, I'd like to add something on this uh, the hot topic here, the, the new provider. The problem was, for me, the provider was following the uh, new releases from very back. For example, uh, I, I can't find some uh, properties in the Kubernetes provider, which are inherently there for new release of Kubernetes. So I think this thing, uh, this uh, thing solves that problem. Whenever some, some new release uh, is published. Uh oh. Because uh, they don't have to work on that anymore. Uh, I think that's the- that's Rene, the you froze a bit there. Could yeah, you... we, we lost you for about 10 seconds there. Okay, uh, so uh, but what I mean is, this, uh, if, if you configure it with uh, Kubernetes provider version two, then you don't have to follow the Kubernetes new release versions uh, from back because they will be immediately available. Uh, so it was a very big problem because Kubernetes provider was following uh, the uh, real Kubernetes from back. So it, 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 it takes, for example, months, six months to, to, to have those new properties in those uh, Kubernetes provider. So, but fr from now on, uh, they will be immediately there uh, for your service. I think that's one of the biggest uh, benefit. And the second is, for example, I, when I would like to uh, deploy something to Kubernetes, uh, I, I don't have to convert it to HCL anymore, uh, but uh, I can use those, those uh, Kubernetes YAML clean files, which I like a lot. Uh, directly in my uh, Terraform code, so okay. it's, it's single single source of truth. Uh, I, I can use them with uh, CTL, and I can use them. Oh, cool! With gotcha. Terraform. Yeah, so you so can just use pure YAML. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't have to use I can I can I can test it. Yeah, yeah. I can test it through this cube CTL. I can. That's then cool. uh, I'm I'm pretty much sure with that. I can. Yeah. So I don't have to convert them to Terraform. This I think that's very very big thing. That me. makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that Actually, sounds yeah. awesome. That's that really a... sounds awesome. I mean, I agree with the first point of view. Like, yeah. I love the alpha provider. It's going to save a lot of time for a lot of people. <laughs> like, I remember I, tr I was trying to define some uh, very low system uh, pods that I needed when an EKS cluster were starting up. I was doing that in Terraform, and I could not set priorities or something like that for the pod because Terraform did not support it. So this provider fixing it, yeah, it's a very big deal. It's going to make so many workflows so much better, but it's an alpha. Yeah, I, yeah, 
Yeah, Alpha. Uh, I'm so glad you said that though, because I've been contemplating moving more and more uh, of some of the stuff we've been doing uh, with Helm and Helm File into Terraform. And if this is the case, based on what you said, yeah, I think we're going to wait until this is uh, more mature and is uh, a great way to do that. I was wondering too, I was looking at an old thread a while back. Um, some of the issues I think have been addressed in the, the Terraform provider, but also some of the stuff I saw was interesting was um, one person was complaining that um, it says while Kube applied as a like a kind of a, their own version of a JSON strategic merge that mm -hmm. uh, Terraform uses a JSON merge patch that so can get different results between doing Kube cuddle mm -hmm. and using the Terraform provider. And then also there's this also thing where it does a transitive delete before replace model, um, which is could cause problems um, with, you know, between Kubernetes and the Terraform provider. And also some of the stuff they had before where the weight logic was highly immature. And so certain resources um, would not be ready and Terraform would try to apply it or something like that. Um, so there's some type of mismatch between the beha operational behavior of kubectl and Helm on top of that and Helm file on top of that versus let's say the Terraform provider as it stands right now. Uh, that's, that's good to call out the discrepancies that you might get from those outcomes. Uh, that that sounds yeah, that sounds like reason enough to maybe hold off uh, from using both in the same environment right now if you want to have consistent uh, results. I do want to say we got to pause here though. We are out of time for today. We've gone a, a few minutes over. Thank you everyone so much for your participation. I appreciate it. This was an effective, really effective office hours. I got a lot out yeah. of it. So uh, thank yeah, you thank, much. You. thank you, thank you so much. Um, uh, so a recording Appreciate of this uh, session is going to be posted to the YouTube channel. Uh, you can check that out in a few hours and uh, feel free to share that with your team. Also, if you ever want to book a session with Cloud Posse, feel free to head over to cloudposse.com slash quiz. And uh, we look forward to talking with you. See you all uh, next week. Same time, same place. Take care. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.